In this video, I want to explain how to go about doing maximum likelihood estimation for our beer example that we introduced in the previous video. So here, just to recap, we imagined that we worked in a bar or we managed a bar and we observed the waiting times between consecutive beer orders. And we measured these in minutes and we recorded sort of N of these measurements. And the idea is that we, we sort of imagined in the previous video under a couple of assumptions, one being that events that a beer is uh, being actually ordered occurs independently of other beer orders. And the fact that these events occur at the same rate throughout time means that an exponential distribution is a reasonable probability distribution to use in this particular example. And we found in the previous video that the probability density function in this case was given by lambda times e to the power minus lambda ti, where ti is one of these individual waiting times where i is an index that runs from 1 up to n. So that's the probability density function for a single observation. What does it look like for a vector of our observations? So here we have the probability of, or the probability density of t with a, a line underneath it to indicate we're now dealing with a vector, given lambda is equal to, well, the first observation we just have a probability density lambda e to the minus lambda t1. Then if we assume that the second observation, so that will be now indicating the sort of 0.5 time here, is an independent observation compared with our first observation, then all we need to do is we multiply the probability density by the probability density of that second point. So now we get e to the minus lambda t2, where t2 here would be 0.5. And then we continue this on up until our nth observation. So here we just then get lambda e to the minus lambda tn. So just to recap, the reason we're multiplying the individual densities together is because we're assuming independence of our observations. Then we notice in each of these terms here, we have a lambda. So we're going to have lambda n times, which means that we're going to get a lambda to the power n. And then we also notice that we've got e to the minus lambda times a time in each of them. So what we get here is we get e to the minus lambda, and then we're going to get t1 plus t2 all the way up to Tn, which we can simply rewrite as lambda to the n times e to the minus lambda times the sum from i equals 1 to n of Ti. So that's the probability density associated with all of our observations. Now what we want to do in maximum likelihood is we want to find the value of lambda so notice that we're varying lambda here, and so now I'm talking about a likelihood rather than a probability distribution. So to, to find the maximum likelihood estimate, what we need to do is we need to find the value of lambda that maximizes this likelihood. And we do that by differentiating. But it turns out it's easier if we first of all take the log of our density here. So we take the log of p of t given lambda, which is equal to here, we just get n times log of lambda minus lambda times the sum from i equals 1 to n of ti. So notice that I've introduced this sort of small l here to represent a log likelihood. And that the exponent here has disappeared because whenever we take the log of an exponent, we just get the thing to which the exponent is being raised to the power. Okay, now that I have the log likelihood, what I want to do is I want to differentiate it. So I take the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to lambda. And if I do that, the first term here, if I differentiate that, well, n is just a constant. If I differentiate log, the natural log, I just get 1 over whatever the input is of the log. Here it's lambda. And then I'm just going to get from the second term, well, lambda is, is just appearing as itself here, so that's going to disappear and I'm just going to be left with the sum from i equals 1 to n now of ti. Then if I want to maximize the likelihood, then I set this derivative equal to 0 and then our lambda here is going to define the maximum likelihood estimator for lambda. So I'm going to put a hat on it like I have done here. If we rearrange this, then what we actually obtain is that lambda hat is equal to n, our sample size, 
over the sum from i equals 1 to n of ti, which we can actually rewrite if we notice that this denominator term here is the same as n times the average waiting time, t bar. And the numerator is just n, so then the n's cancel, and then we get the quite intuitive result that lambda hat, or maximum likelihood estimator for lambda, is just 1 over t bar. And that makes sense, because if the sample average waiting time is, let's say, 2 minutes, then that says that the average number of beers that are being ordered per minute, which is what lambda represents here, is a half. Okay, so this down here is the point estimate of the average number of beers that are being ordered per minute. But what about if we want to assign some degree of uncertainty to that estimate? How do we go about doing that? Well, the idea is, in maximum likelihood, we can do that by taking the second derivative of our log likelihood with respect to lambda. So I get d2l over d lambda squared now is just equal to, well, the second term here is going to disappear, and the first term we just get minus n over lambda squared. Then we can calculate something which is known as the information matrix, I, and that's just given by minus the expected value of d2l over d lambda squared in this example, which in this case is just going to be equal to n over lambda squared. So why is that useful? Well, there is a theorem which holds under quite general circumstances which says that the variance of a maximum likelihood estimator here, lambda hat, is going to be always greater than or equal to what is known as the kramer rao lower bound. And the kramer rao lower bound is just equal to 1 over the information matrix. So this is how it works in this example where we're just dealing with a scalar. But if the matrix is actually a matrix, then what we do is we do matrix inversion here. So we do i to the power minus 1. But for this example, we could just do 1 over i. So that means that our sort of asymptotic variance of lambda hat has got to be something like equal to lambda squared over n. Typically, what we do is we actually deal with something which is known as the observed information matrix, which means that essentially we substitute in our sample estimates here. So we substitute in lambda hat for infra lambda, and then our sort of variance is approximately equal to that asymptotically. How does that help us? Well, the idea is that we could use the central limit theorem, and the central limit theorem would say that our maximum likelihood estimator has a distribution which is normally distributed about the true value, let's call it lambda zero, with a standard deviation which is given by lambda zero squared over n all square rooted. And typically what we do in maximum likelihood estimation is we substitute in our sample estimate of the value of lambda. And that gives us a sampling distribution which we can then use to quantify the degree of uncertainty which is present in our estimate of lambda. And you can see that as our sample size, n, increases, then our uncertainty is going to decline in terms of our estimator of the true mean rate at which beers are ordered in this example.